he is the Luke Robitaille of sports media. In essence, he is really good at what he does. He has been an executive, a producer with Fox Sports and beyond. It is Donovan Tarr who enjoys hockey as well, a la the reference to Luke Robitaille. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. And this is the On to Something podcast where I feature and spotlight those who are making it happen behind the scenes, in front of the camera, in sports media, you name it, highlighting them and pointing out their stories, what they've overcome, the adversity, the tribulations, and all of that, while also having a little bit of fun throughout as well. Donovan, thank you for doing this. I'm excited about this. I want to start here. So I know you're an avid hockey player, and I know you played hockey for San Jose State. Yeah. And I know you played hockey well before that when you were younger. Yeah. What would we learn about Donovan from those days that hasn't changed as to the person you are right now? Well, I still love hockey. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I still play a couple times a week as much as I can. I mean, it's really kind of my true love and it's, I think it's my release and my escape, especially uh, as a live producer, you know, you can have so much anxiety and angst built up in you and you have to kind of steer the ship the right way and not show the rest of the control room kind of what's going on internally within you. And then boy, when I hit that rink and I hit that ice, you know, everything just kind of flows out and it's such a great release. And it's, it's that perfect uh, sport of skill and strength and having to you know, power through something and, uh, and yet have the finesse and the skill to, to make that happen. So uh, still love the game. If you're, uh, something that hasn't changed, I still have a really good backhand still a really <laughs> good playmaker. Um, and, uh, and I think my, my leadership, uh, skills, I think it's evolved through the years, but I think I had that a kind of an early age to be able to relate to somebody and relate to a team and relate maybe, um, individually to every player on that team and what it may take to kind of get it going and also have some fun with it too. Because at the end of the day, if you're not having fun, if you're not smiling, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, then why are you doing it? So That's so well said. And with you playing hockey, you're obviously going to dish out some hits, but you're also going to take some hits. So what is the, the biggest injury that you've ever had to deal with during your <laughs> hockey days? Uh, well, a few years ago, I broke my jaw. Whew. Uh, and I was working at Fox Sports, producing uh, UFC content at Fox Sports, producing a weekly news and information show called UFC Tonight every Wednesday on FS1. And then on the weekends, doing all the events, uh, Friday, weigh in, Saturday, you know, eight hours, nine hours of content from a pre-fight show, prelims, main card, hour, hour and a half post-fight show. And I broke my jaw in the middle of all this. Oh, uh, the, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, mind you. <laughs> and... Uh, and yeah, I got hit in the jaw in the second period and I went down and I was like, oh, that feels a little different than just getting hit, a puck hit me um, in the face. And, uh, and I felt like, oh, that feels a little different than just getting a shoulder to the face, it's a little shoulder shimmy or something like that. And uh, I went off and I ended up playing the rest of the game. Um, this is adult league hockey at, in El Segundo, at Toyota okay. Center in El Segundo or the Kings facility. And uh, and I, cause I just love to play and I'm like, well, you know, it's a long way from the heart. Uh, the legs are still working. My arms are still working. I can, I can still play. So I played the rest of the day, uh, went up, had a beer with my guys <laughs> at, the, at the bar there at the facility, try to numb some of the pain, went to work the next day. Um, saw my coordinating producer, Sonny Solberg, and my mount, my jaw was out to here. And I'm like, yeah, I took a puck to the, she's like, you need to go. You need to get out of here right now and go to the doctor and get it checked out. And thankfully I did. Cause it was the Wednesday then before Thanksgiving. And I was just going to sit on it and see if it kind of went away. <laughs> yeah. And uh, obviously it wasn't going to go away. And, and thankfully I went to the doctor that day, you know, got a CAT scan and within three or four hours, my mouth was wired shut for five weeks. Oh and, uh, oh. and I didn't miss a beat at work either. That next Wednesday, I produced UFC tonight. And as you know, in your control room, uh, I'm talking like this the whole time and, wow. and telling the talent to, to, you know, rap or to piggyback on something or tell my director, Tony McEwen to, to take another tape or, or let's fly in that lower third. And I'm doing it all like this. And, and I had to talk to the headset and, um, 
Yeah, I, everybody kind of got a, a, a laugh out of it. I think my talent who are all UFC fighters, you know, they're kind of snickering behind the scenes, but uh, that was probably the worst injury I've had as an adult. Uh, high ankle sprains I've had, high ankle sprains are no joke. Whenever you hear okay. some, an athlete have a high ankle sprain, they hurt. And I, I remember one time about 20 years ago, I got a high ankle sprain and I actually cried because it was, it was hurt so bad. So yeah, high ankle sprains are no joke too. So um, yeah, that was an interesting time for about five weeks. I had to talk through the wire and produce television shows as the primary producer and uh, you know, fly this graphic, roll this B-roll, uh, piggyback on this talent. Hey, get over there. You know, we got this coming up uh, 30 seconds to break in five, four, three, two, one, you know, all that stuff. So uh, it was something else. So, and uh, yeah, if you go to Donovan's Instagram, Donovan.tar, I think he has some pictures from those days where you, yeah, yeah. you, you see the shot that you took of, of your jaw and, and sort of yeah. the tribulation, tribu yeah, exactly, the tribulations you went through. So you've always, and we're talking with Donovan Tar. I'm Brian Fenley, you've always had that love of contact, that love of being a part of sports that involve fighting, hockey, but also when it comes to UFC and, and even boxing with, with Fox, but focusing uh, on the combat sports media that you do in, in, in fighting, when have you had to fight the hardest for a position when you had to prove your credibility the most in your career? Yeah, I think that comes with every new project. You know, you have to kind of approach it, every new project kind of that way. I need to prove myself here. I need to show my bosses, this is the reason why they chose me for this job. And I don't want to let them down. Um, you know, something that, that my bosses at Fox Sports would always say, and Steve Becker, who you interviewed a few months ago, would say is that you want to make, I'm working to make my bosses look better. So I don't want to let them down. There's a pressure kind of within myself that I put on myself. So that comes with every new project, whether it is a UFC show. Um, and, you know, after a while you start going through the motions and it's like, oh, Saturday is another fight and we're doing this, that, and the other. But then when you get those big fights, those McGregor fights, and you may be putting in more wrinkles than you normally would on a normal fight. Um, or you, or you switch from when we switched over from UFC to boxing and we were doing the first Fox sports, PBC pay-per-views. Uh, those are all a new challenge. And those are all something that, that kind of get me out of, out of bed in the morning. And, uh, and you want to create and you want to put on the best show possible and you put on some pressure on yourself and there's external pressures as well, obviously. Sure. And, um, and yeah, I, I'm kind of, my heart rate is kind of, you know, fluttering right now because I'm, I'm putting myself back into that chair and, and, uh, feeling some of those, those good feelings of, of producing content. When do those good feelings come out when you're in the middle of a live production and examples as to how you felt when you pulled off something amazing on live TV? Uh, those feelings come out. I mean, those feelings come out beforehand. Uh, I think, I think you'd be lying if a producer said like, Oh, I never get nervous before a show, or I never feel that anxiety before a show. There's a difference between feeling that anxiety and feeling those nerves and actually showing those nerves um, to the control room and showing those nerves to the team. You don't want to do that. You don't want to lash out and you don't want to uh, uh, create an environment where maybe the, you know, the, the TD is, is, is trigger happy and he pushes the wrong button because heaven forbid if the control room, there's an intensity or, or, or an angst in the control room. So you really have to get find like your Zen moment and, yeah. and, and kind of like those little tricks in your head uh, that work. You know, everybody has their own little tricks, obviously, and what works for them. And it just goes through hours and hours and hours of live production and producing live shows. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, it's, it, it happens before the show. It happens during the show. And then after the show, it's an adrenaline dump. It's just like, <laughs> and, uh, but that's the beauty of live TV. And that's, that's why I got into it. I think it's a direct correlation to my time playing hockey and having to get up for an event and having, you know, Saturday night, you got a game at seven o'clock and, and that whole day leading up to it. It's like, well, I don't want to go for a run and, you know, or I don't want to sit around too much. I don't want to be too active. I want to have my energy for tonight. So I think it goes back to just 
performing on a, a live uh, scale for sports. And then I try to cross over into production. When you're finished up with a production and we, we go inside the mind of Donovan Tarr, what mental checklist are you going through? What are you revisiting? How do you process what you just did following what you just did? Um, first, I want to make sure I'm alive. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Check all my vitals. No, I'm, yes. I'm good to go. Uh, I think I just go over the mistakes. I mean, that's the stuff that kind of beats you up. And that's the stuff that's keeping you uh, awake at night or all those mistakes. You know, nobody produces a perfect show, but it's those little things. How can I get better? How can I uh, put my talent in a better place to succeed? How can I put my team in the control room or my editors or whoever's working in tape in a better place? Um, what went wrong and, and how can we fix it so that the next show is better? I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't dwell too long on the things that worked. Again, those are easy. It worked, great. Let's do it again another time. It's those mistakes that you really kind of lose sleep over. And I, and I think it, that's the way it is for a lot of producers. What worked well when getting the opportunity to team up with Fred Rogan when you mm -hmm. were working the Olympics? I Working with Fred was a dream. And uh, it was because I grew up in L.A., and if you grow up in Los Angeles, you know that Fred for Fred Rogan for NBC Sports, NBC locally, uh, KNBC here, um, he was a pioneer. You know, he would he would do these Rogan's Heroes. He would show bloopers, and it, that was before you had a phone, before you could find it on the internet. He would get bloopers, and they could be two weeks old, but you didn't see it because it was at a Reds game in Cincinnati, and maybe you missed it on Sports Center. And if you didn't see it, then maybe you see, you know, Fred would show it to you. And, uh, and then he was also highlighted uh, high school sports before that was a big thing, before max prep, before all that stuff, he would send photogs out to the local football games and, and, and get highlights of these kids and spotlight these kids. And it's such a cool kind of uh, a civic, he's, he's a civic treasure, you know, in, in, yes. in LA, he really is. And uh, and he goes on and does stuff nationally. I, I produce a lot of national like overnight segments for him for a show called Morning Joe with Joe Scarsborough on MSNBC, uh, First Look. And I would do all that stuff at night. And then those segments would run in the morning on these national programs. So um, working with him was, you learned a lot. He's one of those guys where you write something in the teleprompter. He doesn't read the copy beforehand. So you write something and it's in the teleprompter and he won't read some of your lines. And you're like, ah, that doesn't work for Fred. That might work for another anchor. That might work for the weekend anchor, but he'll omit lines midstream during the broadcast wow. on a teleprompter and it will be seamless. You wouldn't even have known it. I knew it because I wrote it and he didn't want to call, you know, David Ortiz, big poppy. So he just said, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that, that was something kind of special where you know like this guy is a true broadcaster and, uh, and I'm working with a guy that I, I grew up watching, which, is, which was pretty cool for me. And then when you were at KTLA, you were sort of working, I don't know, would be that be considered a, a competitor to him, but you obviously were yeah. in, in, in reverence of what he was doing. When you were at KTLA, what was the one sporting event, the one feature piece that still captivates you all these years later? Well, I started at KTLA and I started the grind in my production world as an intern at KTLA. Wow. And, and when my internship was up at KTLA and it was something that was through school, through San Jose State, I, I had to get an internship for my radio, television and film uh, major at uh, San Jose State. And I wanted to make sure it was my last thing that I did because obviously I was up in the Bay Area. I knew I wanted to come back down to LA and start my career. So I had my internship as the last thing I did. And when that internship was up, I begged them for another internship. And this is 2004, 2005, and the economy wasn't the greatest. They weren't just handing out jobs. Uh, obviously, we're in different times now because of the pandemic. But looking back on it, there weren't a lot of jobs in this world. Um, and so I begged them for another internship. These are unpaid internships. And I made my money coaching hockey or you know working in the service industry. But I just, I loved 
what I saw and I, you know, I got the bug right away. Um, and then from an internship, I remember it was Yom Kippur and some of the producers were out and they're like, well, can, maybe we'll bring you in and we'll actually pay you this time. And, uh, and then I was like, yeah, and that's how my foot kind of got in the door. And I was a production assistant and field producer. Um, but getting back to what you were saying, we produced a show called uh, Sports Plus with Damon Andrews every Sunday night. And I was kind of the lead feature producer on that show, uh, helped out any way possible. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. And it was called Sports Plus because it was sports plus entertainment and music. We, our guest was usually an entertainment based uh, uh, you know, celebrity of some sort. You know, we had George Lopez on one of the shows who's a, a big LA you know, the comedian, uh, big LA sports guy. And, uh, and that was pretty cool. And this was before ESPN Hollywood. So that's right. Yeah. So it was before ESPN Hollywood and we were kind of, I wouldn't say we're breaking, you know, breaking the ground here because I'm sure a lot of people had those ideas too, but we were doing it at a local level at KTLA. And that was kind of, that was cool because Los Angeles is all about the celebrities and the entertainment and to, to mix those two with sports, it's, it's a no brainer. And, you know, obviously ESPN went on to do ESPN Hollywood and uh, the rest is history. When have you felt in your career that you resemble most a celebrity? <laughs> I get Nick Cage a lot. Do you? <laughs> <I> do. <laughs> um, when have I, when, ha, na, na, na. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think Conor McGregor ends up wearing off on you a little bit. You know, that swagger going into the control room when you know that you've done your due diligence on a show and now you're about to produce a live show. Um, you can get a little bit of that. We worked very closely with Conor McGregor and he's, he's a joy to work with. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess that would be the, the answer there. For, for the boxing front and you, you mentioned this earlier, but doing the pay-per-view event, mm -hmm. what was the most logistically challenging aspect of that? Because you, if I'm not mistaken, Donovan, you guys were at AT&T Stadium. You, you were putting on this event. It was a humongous backdrop with thousands and thousands of people. How did you pull off such an endeavor? Well, I mean, I got to hand it to the, to the operations guys at, at Fox Sports. Um, they put that all together. We had two trucks, one desk truck, one fight truck. And the biggest challenge there was the, uh, the relationship between the two you know, how many EVS ops do you have in one truck? How many, you know, tape guys or graphics, where are the graphics coming from? The communication between the two trucks. You don't want to show maybe the same highlights, you know, back to back. You want to have a communication between your, your desk and your fight truck. And when I say fight truck, those are the guys who are calling the fight and the desk was, uh, I ran the desk truck, which was uh, Chris Myers and company uh, for our pre pre show and our post show. And then uh, they would come to us during the event and we were on air for, I mean, it seemed like 12 hours, but uh, you know, it was, it was a good like eight, nine, 10 hours on air uh, when you go pre-fight and, and then the prelims and then the actual pay-per-view and then the post-fight show on, on FS1. And it was the first time we were doing this. Uh, we had done pay-per-views under the UFC umbrella but this was the first time that Fox Sports and the PBC together were doing a pay-per-view. And, uh, and we took a lot of pride in that for sure. And it was, it was a challenge. It was one of those shows where um, you get home and you need another day or two to kind of decompress because you're just done. You know, you've been ramping this up for the past six weeks and making sure your rundown is good. And then obviously there are changes within the event that you have to roll with. Um, but that, yeah, that was another kind of feather in my cap, uh, and a, and a lot of fun to do. Speaking of having pride in something, and I've got one more question for you. Donovan Tarr is with us. I'm Brian Fenley. The pride in launching the FS1 UFC fight night and yeah. being behind that and the success and seeing that grow in terms of viewership and notoriety around the fan base of the sport. Yeah. I mean, uh, when we launched... When we launched FS1, the network, uh, 
the, there was a fight night from Boston, which was essentially the first event. I believe there was a NASCAR uh, race on during the day. Then we came on with the first live studio show in Studio A there at the Fox lot, which is the same studio you'll see every Sunday with the, with the NFL guys or you'll see uh, with, the, with the baseball guys um, during baseball games. And we did an hour long show and there were a lot of mandates that we had to get in and a lot of things. I mean, I remember there were, there were sticklers about our A block being exactly 13 minutes long so that we can, you know, cause there was some algorithm that, you know, then the audience will be there through the commercials and whatever else. And I remember Zach Candido, who is the, uh, who works for the UFC now and basically runs the UFC. He was in the chair producing that, that pre-fight show. And we got to break right on 13 and he turns around to us who were in the second row and he says, right on the screws, you know, and, and, uh, and that was, that was a really, really cool night because we ended up doing all that. And then our guy who was in the main event, Chael Sonnen, who was fighting Shogun Hua wins the fight. And he was a Fox analyst. He was my guy for UFC tonight on Wednesday nights. And, um, and for him to win, it just put, such a nice little bow on everything that we had done prior to that. I, I was probably hired a month or two before we launched FS1 and everything was ramping up to that launch in August. And then for him to win and to get on the mic and, and mention FS1, Fox Sports 1 at the time, you know, we went by Fox Sports 1 and kind of rebranded to FS1. And then we went to uh, Fox Sports Live, which was kind of our sports center type show. And we mm -hmm. went right to that. And, uh, it was a uh, it was another memorable night that uh, will not soon for forget. Yeah, it was pretty cool. They say athletes are tough when they play through injuries. How about Donovan Tarr <laughs> playing through a shut in jaw and still working in the control room and making things happen? That is a team player, and that is one tough guy. Donovan Tarr, check out all of his work. I'm Brian Fenley. He is a czar of sports media. He has done a lot and he is doing a lot. Really appreciate you, Donovan, for doing this. Brian, thanks a lot. Anytime. Really enjoy these segments, as I mentioned to you. It really shines a light on the people behind the camera. And uh, to a guy like me, I just geek out to this stuff. <laughs> yes. So it's, uh, it's a world I love and thank you very much.